Once again, it's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my YouTube channel, if you've got a question about a video, just go ahead, just type it into the comments. I'll gather them all up and answer them here. Let's get started. Leon Richardson, is it possible that an asteroid can enter the Earth's orbit and thus become a moon from our planet? It is possible, yes, but it's not very likely. And as you see, we really, we have the one moon. We don't have any other moons. So let me explain sort of what's going on here. So, so yes, you could have an asteroid somehow get jostled out of its normal orbit and kicked into an orbit that brings it into an interaction with the Earth. But it's going to have some kind of, you know, interaction with the Earth and it's going to be kicked away. The only way that it could form into a stable orbit around the Earth is if it had some kind of three-body interaction, maybe some interaction between the Earth and the Moon, that it sort of, you know, the two push it in some kind of more stable orbit around the Earth. But the problem is that then you've still got the Moon going around and the Earth, and so, it's, so over time the orbit is going to become unstable again and it's going to get kicked out. Now, we have objects that exist in a sort of nearby time with the Earth. They spend some quality time with the Earth and the Moon in an orbit. It doesn't look like they're going around the Earth, but they're sort of going in a strange kind of horseshoe pattern near the Earth, and then the gravitational instabilities kick it out, and, it's, and then it's gone again. And this happens from time to time. Every couple of years, we learn that another object has moved into one of these, these nearby, nearby objects. I think the last one was Corinthi last time. So it, it so it can happen, these things can come close, but not really that they can go into orbit. You would have to have a really amazing set of circumstances. Now, there are objects ar around the solar system that are thought to be captured asteroids or Kuiper Belt objects, and perhaps they happen when the solar system was more dense. Perhaps it's just luck. You know, you take four and a half billion years and the chance that one of these things are going to line up perfectly, but in general, it's very, very unlikely that it's ever going to happen again to Earth. Ron, decline to state. Do theorists have any ideas as to whether dark energy becomes more dilute as space-time expands? Is it becoming more dilute so that the expansion of the universe slows? Well, you've asked one of the big unknown questions that actually astronomers are trying to figure out right now. And so imagine you've got a cubic meter of space. And we know that there is some kind of outward pressure that is, exists in each one of these cubic meters of space across the universe. And the question is, as more of this space expands, is the amount of this outward pressure within this cubic, of every cubic meter of space, is it getting stronger? Is it remaining the same? Or is it getting weaker? And, and there's like some really advanced missions that are going to be launched in the next couple of years, some new telescope surveys, and they're literally trying to get to this exact question. Was dark energy stronger in the past? Will it be weaker in the future? We don't know. If it does look like it was weaker in the past and, and that it's getting stronger, then that has that is, this implication of what's known as the big rip, which means that Right now, dark energy is only strong enough to kind of accelerate galaxies away from each other. But maybe over time, if dark energy gets stronger and stronger, it could actually tear galaxies apart, and then maybe star systems apart, and eventually could tear atoms apart and black holes apart if things move along that path. Right now, it looks like dark energy has remained constant, which means that that the acceleration of the universe is going to continue forever, but it's not going to, the strength of it per cubic meter of space isn't going to increase. But this is still an, un, an unsolved question, and we'll have to find out what happens in the future. PMTC, can ice crust protect humans from Jupiter or Saturn's radiation? If we would colonize these moons in the future and live in underwater habitats somehow? Absolutely, water, is one of the best forms of shielding from radiation that you can get. And here on Earth, if you're below the ocean a little bit, you'd be protected from radiation. Of course, we've got the magnetosphere around the Earth. But on these ice worlds around Jupiter and Saturn, yeah, if you're below a couple of meters of ice, 
you're completely protected from the radiation. So I can absolutely imagine if we do set up future colonies on Europa or Enceladus, wouldn't that be cool? Then, then we would want to burrow into the ice and we'd want to set up, you know, carve out these great caverns under the ice and they would be totally protected from the radiation that's coming from the giant planet. And so, absolutely. In fact, you can imagine future spacecraft wanting some kind of ice shield around them. And there's a great uh, book, uh, Seven Eves, where they talk about having a spacecraft made with, with embedded inside ice. And it's just a great idea. So, absolutely, I would love to see this happen in the future. David Brenz. If we place a telescope on L4 or L5, could it be stable for a longer period of time than L1, L2, or L3? Yeah, totally. The, the, the Lagrange points, it's important to understand the Lagrange points, right? There's five Lagrange points. Three of them are kind of in line with the two objects. So you've got the, the Sun and you've got the Earth, and you've got the L1 point, which is in between the Sun and the Earth. You've got the L2 point, which is on the other side of the Earth, but still lined up. And then you've got the L3 point, which is on the other side of the Sun, right? So they form kind of a line, sort of. And those three points are unstable which means that as soon as you start to, to move away from the center point of the Lagrange point, you need more and more fuel to get back to that place. And any spacecraft there will eventually drift because of gravitational interactions with other objects in the solar system. It's just not stable. But the L4 and the L5, which are 60 degrees ahead and behind on the orbit of the planet, those are stable. In other words, they're, you know, we always imagine them as kind of like a bowl and so if you have a marble and you put the marble in the bowl, the marble is going to roll down to the bottom of the bowl and stay there. And so if you were able to put a spacecraft, a space telescope into the L4 and the L5 point, it would be stable. Now the problem is that they're just really far away. They're tens, I'm trying to think, you know, several million, 10 million kilometers away or more from the Earth. In other words, you have to then get a spacecraft out there, the time to communicate with it, it's a harder place to get to. But, uh, you know, there's a great idea that the L5 Society wanted to put great big rotating space stations in the L4 and the L5 points as a place that humanity could live because you don't need fuel to maintain that position. It would be a great place to put a space telescope and I'll bet you at some point someone is going to try it out. George Nelson, isn't Martian soil similar to Earth soil? All you have to do is take some chemicals out of it and could grow crops. Martian soil is crushed volcanic rock. No more, no less, right? So you take rocks from volcanoes and you, you know, crush them and you've got Martian soil, regolith. Now it also has this chemical in it that's sort of a toxin known as perchlorates. And those, if you try to plant plants into them, they would have a problem with it. But you can get rid of that stuff with just by washing it. So if you can wash your Martian regolith, you can get those toxins out of the out of the soil. But the thing that the Mars soil doesn't have is any kind of nutrients. You know, here on Earth, soil has has decayed organic material as well as the, the crunched up rocks. And so for us to be able to grow anything on Mars, we would need to add some kind of organic material. Now, if you saw the Martian, they used poop. And that's probably a certain amount of what's gonna be used. The whole um, future Martian colony is gonna be recycling all the food, all the compost, everything, all the organic material that they bring to that planet, it's gonna be very precious. And they're gonna be putting that into their soil, the regolith, to be able to grow crops. And over time, as they grow more and more, they build up more and more organic material, they're gonna be able to plant larger and larger areas. Milan Masset. One time cleanup of the moon will not help because the regolith gets charged from the sun's wind's particles. And since all regolith particles are at a positive charge, they repel and are moving around. They lift up quite a lot during the day. All right, so this is a response to the video that we did last, last week. And, and you're exactly right. And actually we did a whole video about, about the weather on the moon. And obviously there aren't clouds and atmosphere and stuff on the moon, but there is this crazy situation. So the, the, as the, the sun, as the, you know, as the sun rises and sets on the moon, it electrostatically lifts up particles of lunar regolith, this tiny toxic dust that we talked about, and pushes it 
across the surface of the moon. So if you, if you did sweep up the surface of the moon, you would still have to go back and sweep some more because you're getting this, this electrostatic lunar dew. I don't even know what the term really is, but it's just lifting up this dust, pushing it along the moon, and then dropping it again. And it would be a never-ending job, just like sweeping is here on Earth. Irish wristwatch. I have a question for your QA show. We've learned so much from the Mars rovers. What would be the next place in the solar system to send a rover? Europa? I would send a lander to Europa, uh, something to go maybe dig into the ice, something, an ice core drill. A rover would be interesting, but no, Titan. I wanna go to Titan. I wanna see a rover on Titan, exploring the environment there. I would love to see a boat, a submarine on Titan. Titan's where I wanna go. I'd also like to go back to Venus. The moon would be pretty cool too. One of the rover on Mars would be all right, and Europa and Enceladus. Can I just say everywhere? Philip Hughes. In a rotating habitat like an O'Neill cylinder, how would people and equipment go from the stationary portion of the habitat to the rotating portion and vice versa? I've seen this tackled a couple of times in science fiction. So, you know, imagine you've got this rotating cylinder the spacecraft is going to dock with the cylinder. And so the first thing that it does is as it's coming in, it has to get itself a rotation that matches the rotation of the space station. Once that happens, you're gonna be on this spacecraft and you're gonna be turning around and around and it's gonna make you pretty sick. But then once you get you know, onto the landing and you climb up the ladder, you will start to feel gravity as you move up to the outer part of the space station. The alternative way you could go about it is you could dock the, the spacecraft and, and it's not rotating, but the space station is rotating around it. And then you'd have to sort of jump through onto the ladder, grab it. And then as you move your way up the ladder, you're gonna feel more and more gravity. It's gonna be a difficult maneuver and require, I think a lot of practice for people to get a handle on how to do it. Uh, you know, the other option is that the spacecraft comes and docks to the space station, but that's tough because, you know, the rotating part of the space station, because it's all moving. So you're going to want to dock at a place where, there, where, there, where no part of it is moving, and then the astronauts are going to want to move out to the rotating part and experience the gravity. Alexander Hoffman. If and when we become a Type 2 civilization and start mining the solar system for resources, Will that throw off the balance or orbits of the solar system? Say we mine Mercury and it disappears as a planet. Would that throw off the balance of the other planets? No, it would improve the balance of the other planets. All of the, like the sun and all of the planets in the solar system are interacting with each other gravitationally, and especially Jupiter and Saturn and the big planets in the solar system. If you remove any one of them, then you lose that gravitational instability from these worlds. If you remove Mercury, then Venus would experience less of a gravitational wobble from Mercury. If you remove Jupiter, then all of the other planets would experience less gravitational interaction. And in sort of the perfect situation, you would have thus one star and one planet going around it, that would be the minimum amount of instability in the system. So no, if you removed Mercury, it would just make things more stable. Let's get rid of them all. Chris Clark. Would you have a problem with humans stripping the surface of the moon bare for collection of helium-3 and using regolith for making concrete? Would it be ethical? When we think about the resources on Earth, right? We think about sort of this connection of life and the environment, but on the moon, it's a rock. It's a great big rock covered in helium-3 and dirt it's gonna have a certain amount of intrinsic beauty and it would suck to kind of strip mine the entire moon, but we can pretty safely assume there's no life there that is really gonna care about what we do to the moon. So, so I personally don't have a problem with us mining the moon, using it for concrete, things like that. But, I, but it is an interesting question, like even to like, what is the aesthetic beauty of the moon worth? What is, you know, how important is it for us to keep the moon in its kind of pristine form the way it is now? Uh, we have other places on Earth that are, you know, that aren't very hospitable to life, but are very pristine, are very important to us. Like, think about our interactions with Antarctica. There's not a lot of life there, but 
but it's very important for us to keep Antarctica in as pristine a situation, you know, in pristine environment and protect it as much as we can. So, so I'm kind of torn. I'd love to hear what you think. You know, does it make sense to just grind up the moon and turn it into helium fuel and concrete? Or is it a place that we want to kind of keep in the form that we found it so that it's always in that form for, for millions of years into the future? Siddington. What about volcanism on Mars? Any consensus on how long ago it stopped? That's still a bit of an, of an unsolved question. There's a couple of interesting lines of evidence, right? We know that there was volcanism on Mars a long time ago. We see the big shield volcanoes, Olympus Mons, those guys. And, and we can see some of the more recent uh, sort of lava flows. Will Olympus Mons erupt again? Probably not but we don't know how long it's been since it erupted last. It could have been uh, tens of millions of years ago. But astronomers have detected this methane in the atmosphere of Mars, and there's sort of two possibilities for this methane. One possibility is that the methane comes from life, which would be really exciting, but the other possibility is that there's some kind of volcanism on Mars that's generating the methane. And so there could still be some kind of volcanic vents, things like that, that are actually generating methane and putting it out onto Mars. So, so it's actually still kind of an unsolved question and more research is necessary. All right, well that's it. That's another QA wrapped up. As always, Appreciate all the questions that everyone throws at me. Wherever you are on the channel, go ahead, just type in your question. I will gather them up, answer them here, and I'll see you all next week. Oh, playlist. Uh, here's a playlist of all the stuff that I'm watching right now.